Welcome back, folks. <laughs> Here we go. It's like like conference over. <laughs> That's it. Oh my gosh. All right. Um. I guess. Uh, yeah. I guess we can get started, and then I will drag people inside slowly, whether they like it or not. <laughs> um, all right, our, our next presenter today is Alexander Wise, who's a technical account manager at Verica, uh, and his talk is titled, School of Proc, Kubernetes Security in the Post-PSP World. Please give it up. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. Like every other speaker has said, so so cool to be back in a conference uh, setting in person, seeing people. I love this. Uh, but I'm I'm Alex. I'm here to talk about Kubernetes security. I'm here to talk about the the recent past and near future of Kubernetes security. Uh, so about uh, a year ago, back April 2021, uh, with uh, the release of Kubernetes 1.21, the Kubernetes team also announced a deprecation of pod security policy API in Kubernetes. <clears throat> pod security policies were the only built-in way to configure your Kubernetes cluster so that uh, a, a workload could not be submitted that, that could trivially escalate to root on the node. Um, but, but Kubernetes deprecation is just an initial first step. It's initial early warning that says, hey, this is going to go away eventually. Um, you know, start making plans to come off of it, find something else that, that will work for you. And there really are no plans to remove pod security policy until Kubernetes 1.25, which is the next Kubernetes release. 1.24 came out last month. Um, so the next, uh, the next version of Kubernetes probably will not have pod security policies in them. Um, there's still no reason to worry if you, if you might be using pod security policies because you have... Most, most folks are not on the freshest upstream release of Kubernetes as it comes out, and uh, you will have at least a year of 1.24 being supported before that eventually goes away. <clears throat> so you're not going to be forced to force off of pod security policies. A lot of folks are not, on, are not using pod security policies. It's a, we'll, we'll get into it. It's a little bit difficult of a, of a, of a tool to use. Um, but yeah, we will, uh, we, will, we will get into that later. A um, little bit about me. Um, I am, my name's Alex Wise. Um, I've been doing Kubernetes stuff for a little while. My first production cluster was uh, 1.6 a little while ago. I've since then secured Kubernetes workloads a lot of different places. I've done for SaaS, for robotics, for ML workloads. Um, if you want to ever nerd out about development environments or build tooling and how to secure that, let me know. Um, I'm currently at a company called Verica. We build tools to help you secure uh, and find the, the safety margins of your Kubernetes clusters, of your Kafka <coughs> uh, clusters. I also do work around town uh, for the Software Freedom School. I teach for them, write some classes for them, um, helping beginners learn how to use, why to choose open source software. So some folks uh, may have seen me for that. My, you can find me on Twitter, AWS Narcotech. So that, that's me. Um, I do want to lead off here with a couple quotes from the co-chairs of SIG Security for Kubernetes. Uh, the first one um, indicates what, what value pod security policies gave us, uh, what, how people used them, what was the threat model they were trying to stop. Um, the other one will talk about the design decisions, the philosophy, where they want to move Kubernetes to, why they're deprecating pod security policies, and what the replacement needs to do better. So the first quote here is from Tabby Sable uh, from her talk from KubeCon last year, PSP replacement, past, present, and future. Permission to create pod should not mean permission to be root on every node in the cluster. So this is the problem that pod security policy existed to solve. Kubernetes is a, is a system administration tool. It wants to do system administration -y things. It wants to help you run privileged workloads, perform upgrades, things like that. So if you're able to run those kind of privileged workloads, um, there are a thousand different paths of attacks, ways to, do, to escalate your privileges out of a container, ways to perform container breakouts that mean that there's really a very fuzzy line between create pod in Kubernetes and root on the node. And we'll talk a few of those in a little bit, but but that's that's what PSP's solved. That's what the replacement needs to solve. That, that's why we're talking about this. 
The next quote here is from Ian, the other co-chair of SIG Security, tweet back in 2020 saying, Kubernetes, emphatically, not secure by default. Um, and, and we should not paper over that fact that, that, that what Kubernetes needs to do better is to be secure by default. Um, you shouldn't need to be a secure, container security guru to, to be able to, to run a secure cluster. So that's where we see PSPs were, were falling down and what the replacements may hopefully do a little bit better. It's really important, I'm gonna put it here. We'll probably refer back to it, but Kubernetes needs to be secure by default. So wayfinding slide here, we just finished intros. We're gonna talk about what is slash was the pod security policy. We're gonna dive a little bit more into what those rough edges were, why it's going away. Then talk about pod security admission, it's replacement. Um, and then if pod security admission doesn't work for you, or if you're, if you're a security researcher or an attacker out there trying to see what you might be up against in a, in, a, in a cluster, we'll talk about some of the other security controls that solve this problem in Kubernetes. <clears throat> All right, so diving into it. What is a pod security policy anyway? So pod security policy was an admission control plugin it was, it's the only uh, security system like this that's built into Kubernetes natively. <clears throat> and that, that, that's important, right? It was, it's pretty long in the tooth. It was G8 in, in 1.6. Um, and what it does is it lets you configure requirements for the security context for any pods that run there. And those are extremely granular. We'll take a look at those, some of those. But you can be very specific about the, secu the security controls that you want on your, uh, on your workloads. It's also extremely flexible. Um, you can configure your pod security policy to, to default you to secure settings, to, to, to secure, or, or just validate and say, no, you're trying to run as privileged, we won't let that on the cluster. Um, you can set these policies up so that they apply to, to all namespaces and, and everything cluster-wide, or you can scope them to specific privileged privilege namespaces. So there's, it's very flexible and very granular, which, which creates some foot guns for, for folks um, who may not have expertise in this. So uh, this is some of the granularity. This is just a sampling of some of the, the controls you would have uh, with pod security policies setting those security contexts. You can see things like running privilege containers. Um, you can see in Linux capabilities, any sorts of, of, of volume mounts you might be able to add. There's um, SC Linux modes and app, ar ar app armor settings that would be configurable here. Um, and if you see, there's a, an allow privilege escalation Boolean, which is kind of my favorite Boolean, like set this to false and hey, we've solved security, right? We, we did it. We fixed cyber. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, Anyway, so how does this work in practice? So, uh, so pod security policies, they, they build on the, the existing RBAC and workload identity APIs of Kubernetes. Um, essentially, every pod has a service account associated with it, and, and that says what permissions that pod has. So PSPs just sort of build on that and say, okay, if you, if you have this identity, apply this policy to it. You might have these extra permissions or you might be running, you know, very, very restrictive. But pods, map to service accounts, map to either cluster roles or roles, and then those map to PSPs. If you're, if you're mutating, you're, you're gonna get one PSP. If you're, if you're validating, you might get a whole array of them. Uh, the drawback here is that if you're not using workload identity in, um, in your Kubernetes clusters. So for instance, if all of your pods run as the default, underscore default service account in a namespace, you might have some heavy lifting to do before you could start to use pod security policies. <clears throat> but in theory, what I could do here, I could make a, a really restrictive cluster role that is cluster wide that everything sort of gets by default. Um, and then if I have more privileged workloads, if I have security tooling, if I have, I have operational tooling or, or, or legacy workloads, then I have a, a role that's specified to a single namespace and, and gives me just those perms there. So it can kind of do this, high, this really cool hierarchical uh, setup where, where I, I can get my least privilege, right? So that's what this kind of looks like here. On the left, we have a cluster role that's cluster wide. It's very restrictive. Um, on the bottom there, that says resource names. That is the name of your pod security policy. 
the block all the things policy on the right and your lift and shift legacy namespace, you've got an all the perms pod security policy. So that you can kind of do this, this really cool thing where you have, have hierarchies and you can run the things that need permissions um, just sort of as with those elevated permissions without making the cluster as a whole um, less secure. Pretty cool. So I think I can do something like that. How do I turn it on? All right, so PSP, uh, you would turn it on just by, by uh, passing a flag in, this enable admission plugins flag um, to your to cube API server start command. Um, you'll actually just be a big long string of comma separated plugins uh, that, are, that are all sort of on by default. This will typically live in your cluster build out scripts or, or your, your infrastructure's code, that kind of automation. Um, so I, I can do that. I can update this, right? And the idea is I'll, I'll turn this on and then I'll go in, I'll start looking at my workloads, I'll start crafting policies uh, similar to what that previous slide was and, and, and set this up, right? And so I'll do that and everything breaks because uh, pod security policy is a security control. It's denied by default. If I turn it on and I don't have my PSPs created, uh, no pods can be scheduled. Everything gets denied, everything gets shut down, and everyone's mad at me. Um, so I need, to know, I, I need to know exactly what my policies are gonna look like before I turn it on, but I, I can't turn it on until I know what my policies look like. I kinda have this chicken and egg thing, right? I, I can't quite, uh, I, I don't know a priori what my PSPs need to look like, and I, I, I can't really, find my way into them. But, but what I, I could do is I could like make a really permissive global policy, then turn it on, and then start incrementally um, you know, creating policies for different workloads and finding least privilege. I could do that. There are some caveats. Um, you know, it, it will take some, some trial and error to get this right, probably, depending on how complex I, I need to be with it. And it's not a great default. I mean, we, we can just say that, right? This is, a, this is, this is uh, from, a, from a defender's perspective, um, I, I have to do a lot of maneuvering to, to get these turned on, to get these running in my environment. And, and if we're trying to be secure by default, then we're kind of falling down here. <clears throat> All right, one moment. Cool. Any questions so far on that? No? All right, so we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper into pod security policies. Um, we're gonna say, okay, I have done everything I said in that previous section, right? I've set up these, these cluster roles. I've got everything running. I think I'm running pretty secure, fairly least privileged. I'm feeling good about it. I'm probably in the top 10% of secure Kubernetes clusters operators because a lot of folks don't use PSPs because they're kind of difficult. Then I come across a blog post. And it says, Kubernetes, insecure host path mounts. Okay, okay. Um, I dive in. I dive into this blog post and I think, oh, duh, right? So Kubernetes lets you mount a server's direct, a directory from the server inside your container as a, as a volume inside that container, similar to how you would do it with Docker, right? Well, if I just mount the root directory of my server inside my container, I can do all kinds of shenanigans. Uh, this blog post has you just chirruting into, into that directory and taking over the server that way, but you could, you could cat Etsy shadow, you could steal SSH keys, you could steal the, the Kubernetes node certs, right? There's a lot of mischief you can have if you have full access to the root directory on a Linux server. But I can fix this, right? I can block this. PSPs, I have them set up, they give me the tools to, to, to fix this. And it would look something like this, right? I don't, I don't even, I don't, I'm, I'm in the cloud, right? I don't, I don't need this host path. I don't need to be mounting directories inside of containers from, from my server. My, my, my servers are mostly immutable. There's no, there's no uh, state saved there. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just I, won't allow, um, I won't allow host paths. I will update all my pod security policies in my cluster and say, you know, these, this is the list of the types of volumes we allow. These are sort of Kubernetes native things or cloud native things. We don't, we don't need host paths. We don't want to touch them. And I feel good. I feel super secure. Um, until I see this tweet from Duffy. And that's a, that's a heck of a tweet. Uh, this can run this on any, 
any cluster that's not running pod security policies and get, get root on a node. And it's a heck of a tweet, right? Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a container guy, I'm a, I'm a Kubernetes guy, I can, I, can, so I can parse this, right? There's nothing here that, that I can't parse. So kubectl run, pretty standard. The image doesn't matter because we're overriding it. Okay, host pid true, ns enter. All right, I think I see what's going on here. And I, 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 I remember something I heard about, about Linux containers. So Linux, so containers aren't, aren't little boxes, right? I remember Alice Goldfuss's talk here, and she had a mantra about Linux containers. Containers are processes anchored to namespaces controlled by C groups. Uh, okay, so, so container is just a process. It's got, it's got PIDs. Uh, it's in a namespace, and that says what uh, the Linux namespace says what other processes it can see and what, what devices it can see, and, and the C groups control what resources it has access to. So if I do a Docker run, okay, I, I start a Docker container. Yeah, I can see that it, it has a, 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 it is a process just on my server. It has a PID. Um, I, I can do some Linux internal stuff and see the namespace that it's running in, and, and I can use that nsenter command and go into that namespace. Um, you know, I, I can also see this information about the C group it's in. So, so containers are just processes and namespaces. So going back to Duffy's tweet, all right. So running host pid true, that means that I'm running in the host's process space, the host namespace, and I'm using nsenter to, to go into that namespace. That means that I can see every process and every device on the node, I can touch every file, so that, I'm, I'm root at that point. Um, everything in Linux is a file, so if I do that, I, I'm, I am essentially root on the server. But I can fix that, right? I can, I can, I can, I can use my PSPs to make host PID false and, and privileged false and host network false and privilege escalation false. I can do all that to stop it, but it's not very secure by default. I've had to be a container breakout expert to understand these paths of attack so that I could craft these policies so that I could stop it. And, and, and that is not a place that Kubernetes wants to be. <clears throat> um, so wouldn't it be cool if Kubernetes bundled up everything that it knew about container escalations and privilege escalation and container breakouts into a policy, right? Because I talked about insecure host path mounts and host bid takeovers, but, but you, there's mounting the, the, the container runtime socket inside the container. There is running with cap BPF and cap net raw to, to forge packets. There, there is uh, unmasking the slash proc mount. There are all these sorts of container breakouts, all these acrobatics you can do to get out of a container when you can run privileged workloads. <clears throat> and wouldn't it be cool if Kubernetes bundled all those up for me? So now we get to the PSA on PSAs. Pod security admission is the replacement for, for pod security policies. It is also an admission controller. Uh, entered beta very recently, uh, 1.23, still behind a feature gate. <clears throat> pod security admission is, is significantly simpler than pod security policy. Uh, it, it works at the namespace level. You essentially, uh, in, in Kubernetes, labels are, are key values that you, that you assign to objects. Um, so you're assigning these to the namespace object in Kubernetes and basically setting it to one of three security levels. And any, any workloads, any pods that run in that namespace will need to conform to whatever that, that, that level is. Um, so what you're getting here, you're getting a loss of that granularity. You don't have that, that toolkit that you had um, that, that you could use to craft really specific uh, policies. But you get better defaults. If you're, if you're not a container security expert, you, you can um, get a default secure setting and reasonably trust that there, that you're not, there aren't uh, paths of attack, that there aren't privilege escalations that could be performed. <clears throat> so I like this, um, this first sentence from the pod security admission docs. Uh, Kubernetes pod security standards define different isolation levels for pods. These standards let you define how you want to restrict behavior of pods in a clear, consistent fashion. Pod security restrictions are applied at the namespace level when pods are created. So this is all about pod security standards. So let's, let's dive into what those are. I said there were, they were three levels, right? The first, privileged. 
basically no restrictions, right? If we're not going to stop every privilege escalation, um, you know, we, we will we'll assume that the privilege can be escalated there. Let's, let's not restrict anything. <clears throat> Baseline is your, your trade-off between compatibility and, and, and this is key here, the known privilege escalation paths. Um, it, it wants to allow as much as possible to run without opening the avenue for create pod to be root on the node. Um, some, some of the things that are enforced in a baseline, um, you can't have privilege true. There's a list of specific Linux capabilities that, that you can have, but none of the really good ones like cap sysadmin. Um, no host paths at all. We saw host paths were really problematic. Um, and there, there, there's, a, there's a list of others, but those are, those are some of them. The, the third uh, mode that we can run in here is restricted. Um, and that's, that's enforcing every known pod security best practice. So things like your containers can't be running as root. Um, any capabilities have to be, have to be dropped, any Linux capabilities. Uh, whatever the, the, the host SC Linux mode is, that has to be enforced. Things like that. Um, also, there's one where, where no child processes that are spawned inside the container can have more permissions than the container, it, than the, the parent PID, um, things like that. So, so that, those are our baselines. Um, very simple buckets that we can, we can put our workloads in. And it's behind the feature gate right now, but it's enabled by default. We are moving closer to secure by default in Kubernetes with pod security admission. All right, so let's, let's, let's take a look here. What, what do these labels look like? I said it's just, just two labels um, that you would set on, on the namespace object to, to set this up. So the first one is this mode uh, label. Um, so mode, you enforce audit or warn. The only difference between audit and warn is audit is put writing to your audit logs, um, and warn is just writing out to the console. Um, and then you would, the level is one of those three buckets, the privilege, baseline, or restricted. So you would say something like pod security .io slash enforce baseline. And in that namespace, now every pod that, that could be scheduled in that namespace must comply with the baseline security standards. So no running is privileged. Uh, you'll, you'll get rejected. You won't be allowed to run in the cluster there. <clears throat> the other thing I want to call out here is the addition of that warn mode is pretty awesome. Um, what that does is I, I can set that and I can start looking at my logs. I can start looking at my console to see, oh, you know, am I getting warnings? And uh, will I need to, to move things to different namespaces? If I switch to enforce, will things start breaking? Uh, it gives me a roadmap to go from brownfield to secure cluster, which was huge. It's that chicken and egg problem that we have with PSPs. We don't have here because we have a warn mode that we can, we can start using right away. Uh, by default, out of the box. So um, the other thing to keep in mind is is the life cycle of these of these versions. Right, a baseline a security isn't set in stone. Um, we could imagine that the baseline security standard might need to change in the future. You know, if if one of the researchers out there starts finds the way to to leverage one of the the allowed Linux capabilities to do some new fancy container breakout. Baseline needs to get updated there. Um, and so operators need to sort of have a version in mind and there needs to be a path to go from, from version to version. Um, and SIG Security has decided, let's just tie it to the Kubernetes lifecycle. Kubernetes releases basically quarterly. Um, so, so you can label here and say, my enforced version is Kubernetes 1.24. And your enforced, uh, your enforced, uh, your baseline standard that will be using the Kubernetes 1.24 version of that baseline. So those are the two labels. That's how you use it. That's pod security admission in a nutshell. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, we get we get better defaults. We get uh, we get a roadmap. We get that warn mode. We get that roadmap to be able to turn it on to see what might break. Um, and it's just been a, 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 an easier end user experience. For I want to be clear, but the, the built-in, because this is the built-in mode of running Kubernetes securely, they wanted it to be usable by, by folks who were not container breakout artists. Um, all right. Uh, 
but but PSA won't be usable by everyone. Um, you may have you may have compliance regimes or security policies that don't map to to one of these buckets, right? You may not have your workload split up into namespaces in a way that really let, lets you leverage this. Um, you may need to get to get more granular. You may have custom hosts that have to run that SC Linux uh, configuration. So. What do you do then? Uh, what, what is out there for you if you can't use pod security admission and pod security policies are going away? Well, I said at the, I said at the top that pod security policies were an admission control plugin for, for Kubernetes. Pod security admission is an admission control plugin for Kubernetes. So that really begs the question here, what's an admission controller in Kubernetes? And I've stolen this, uh, this, this diagram from the, from the Kubernetes docs. Um, so imagine you run your kubectl apply command. You're submitting a new pod, a new workload to, to run in the cluster. It, it enters the left side of this diagram here uh, as an API request to the API server. And then there's a series of different validators, of different, uh, of logic that's applied to say, okay, is this, is this workload that has been submitted, is this good? Uh, is, the per, is the person who submitted it allowed to submit that? And, and, and is it well formed? And there's a, there's a ton of these. They're not they're not all security related, um, but these these admission plugins, for example, um, there is one that will check and say if you if you want to run a pod, uh, are you trying to schedule that in a namespace that is currently in the process of being deleted? Because if you were to do that, then then we would get into a, an infinite chain of of deleting things. Um, and the circuit breaker for that is a is an admission control plugin. So. There are lots of these, um, uh, more than a dozen, um, and they really fall into one of two types. They fall into, um, over here on the right, we have the validating admission plugins that those just say thumbs up, thumbs down. Is this workload allowed to run? Um, hopefully if it's a thumbs down, you get some sort of an error message that gives you a reason why. Um, a little bit further to the left, you see the mutating ones. Um, if you were to run your pod security policies in a way that like defaults everything to privileged false, that's your mutating admission webhook. Um, I think Nathaniel, when he talked about service meshes, a pretty common application for, for mutating admission webhooks is to automatically insert that service mesh container into every workload uh, or, or a logging container sidecar into every workload. So that that's... Um, that's what you have as far as admission control in Kubernetes. And, and Kubernetes is extensible, it's flexible. <clears throat> and there are three of these plugins that are enabled by default that, uh, that give you extensibility and give you the ability to write custom admission logic. Um, the image policy webhook, the validating mission webhook, and the mutating mission webhook. You would set these up. They're just a series of Kubernetes objects you would apply. One of those is a, is a pod, is a, is a web server that's running. Um, when a user goes to submit a workload to Kubernetes, it, it reaches out to that web server and says, does this pod spec look good, thumbs up or thumbs down, and gets the response. But that's your custom logic that you can run. And, and pod security admission, um, if you can't enable the feature gate, they give you all of the, the steps and all the code to, to run this separately as its own separate validating admission webhook. Um, it, is, it is a very valid way to, to run it. Um, all it is under the hood is a, a validating mission webhook. It's just the one that's included by default with Kubernetes as well. And you don't have to, to write this, these custom web servers, these custom applications, right? There are, there, this is a paved road. If you, if you want to do this, there are lots of big, mature projects, open source projects, to configure custom admission logic in Kubernetes. So all the things you could do with pod security policies, you can do with these projects. And you can, uh, frankly, do them a little bit easier and you can be a little more flexible, do them a little bit better. Um, I just threw up the four here that I'm familiar with. There are more out there. Um, <clears throat> but for instance, you can, you can do more with these than you could do just with pod security policies by themselves. You can, you can get all the pod security standards and all of the PSP configuration, all of that security context granularity, but you could also do things like require labels on all of the, all of your workloads. So so any pod would have like an owner label would map to what what team is the point of contact for that for that workload. Um, if you're using 
Valero or, or Kasten or some other sort of uh, Kubernetes backup uh, vendor, backup software, you can, you can help configure your backup policy uh, using admission control. I talked about adding sidecars for logging or for, or for service meshes. Um, you can do things like all images that run in this cluster have to come from my private Docker, my private registry, nothing from Docker Hub um, can run. And there's all sorts of security controls, extra security codes above and beyond even what pod security policy is provided that you can do like, like um, mounting the container socket inside a container or, or doing like um, uh, Nginx, and this, this last bullet point here, Nginx ingress is a is an ingress that runs, um, if you, you, you can apply custom Nginx logic to, your, to the load balancer there, if you pass in an annotation to an ingress object, and that opens the door for things like HTTP smugglers, so you can even like, uh, you know, enforce some controls there that you couldn't before with PSPs. So, so it's a little bit more flexible. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, and, and yeah, if, if PSA isn't for you, um, then, then maybe you want to, to look at some of these, some of these projects here. Um, so yeah, takeaways. Oh man. Um, so pod security policies going away in the next release, probably August. Um, but one, two, four won't go away forever. It'll, it'll, you'll have at least a year there. Um, PSPs were pretty challenging these out of the box. And really to, to craft them, you had to know what you were protecting against. You had to know how to perform container breakouts, which is a pretty high bar for, for operators, for security teams. Um, you, know, you shouldn't need that specialized knowledge to use the most popular container orchestrator in, in the world. Um, so hopefully PSAs do that a little bit better. If you weren't using PSAs because they were complex, maybe you can use, or if you weren't using PSPs because they were complex, maybe you can use PSAs. Maybe, maybe that's a better, a better method for you, easier to get your hands around. Um, if not, other, other, other solutions exist um, that may even be more powerful for you. So um, one other thing I want to call out is that pod security policy deprecation is not the only enormous change going through Kubernetes right now. And it is a big change. It's, it's one of the biggest changes that's ever happened in the history of the, of the project. Um, but at the same time, we have, we have now GA'd uh, dual stack networking as of 1.23, and that's been a, a five-year plan. I think that started in 2017 to come off IPv4 and then go to dual stack and then go back off dual stack, basically write the whole networking stack. Um, Docker Shim was just deprecated as well in this most recent release. Um, that's a huge change that was, that was talking in the community. Hey, shouldn't this be a major version bump for all the things that we're going to be breaking and changing here? Shouldn't this be Kubernetes 2.0? So a lot, of, a lot of big changes coming through the Kubernetes community right now, coming through the Kubernetes project. So if you are uh, an operator of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, or you know an operator of a Kubernetes cluster, have some empathy for them, because they, they might have a lot going on. Um, got some references here. Uh, the uh, Tavi Sable's PSP talk, Ian Coldwater, and Duffy Cooley's abusing Kubernetes default talk, and then some other blog posts there. And that's what I got for you. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, awesome with the uh, pod security uh, admission. That's awesome. Um, two, two questions, really. It could go to three, but we'll see. Um, so with uh, the first question, uh, if you have, sounds like we're just kind of uh, Formalizing in the stacks, you know, you have your your enforce and your uh, audit, your warn. Um, is there any way to uh, enforce and warn at the same time to use multiple modes, uh, or is it one or the other? Um, I haven't tested. I've only had like one cluster with the feature gate on. I believe the the the, the idea with that schema is that you can't have. Uh, you could you can warn on a, a restricted and and then you know enforce a baseline or something, yeah. right? Um, so I, I, I do believe that, but I have not tested it. So that's a great great question. Um, does enforce automatically warn or write some things to the log? I mean, so has log been elevated within access logging? 
Yeah, well, you'll get, um, you'll definitely get console responses. You'll get a reason that it, w it did not pass admission because of, because of the, the label. Um, but then, um, yeah, and, and you'll see that in, in, in event logging as well if you're, if you're capturing the event, the event logs. Will we see who that's from? Or who uh, which user submitted it? Yeah. Uh, I'd have to look at the audit log. I believe the audit log format would have that, not necessarily the event format. Um, it would have had to be done by an authorized user. Um, I, the, the audit logging would have that level, uh, but once it's once it's in Ed CD, it's 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 once it's written to Ed CD as something that, that should be applied, which is on the other side of admission control, then you would you wouldn't have that. But if, but you're if you're stopping at admission control, you would see the apply and you would see the stop. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so SU Linux and App Armor both have you know lots of tooling to parse the audit log and mm -hmm. define you know, custom policies and App Armor profiles. So you have you know the minimum permissions you need to write to make your application run. Does something exist like that for PSA at the moment, or is that tooling that's still being built? Um, so the the security context in Kubernetes. So what 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 PSP was enforcing does let you um, s just defer to. And, and refer out to any app armor or SE Linux controls that you would have. Um, uh, so your question was on, on, on the visibility of, of seeing what would... Just like, like whether there's, the, there's any tooling right now for like parsing the app like incrementally adding um, permissions uh, or, or changing, <laughs> adding yeah. like PSA logic, I guess, to uh, not horribly familiar stuff. Yeah, no. Um, I'm not sure about the, about tooling that exists there. Um, you know, it would it it depends on your on your audit logging setup there. You would get you get responses back. Um, the the admission control side of it, you would see, um, you know, the, that you tried to submit a workload that that was privileged in a place where you couldn't submit privilege. But as far as like if you submit a, 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 an application that needs a Linux capability doesn't have that capability. Um, you know, it might crash. It might have weird behavior. I think you'd be dependent on the application to to log that out or tell you in some way that hey, I don't have CapNet raw here and I need it. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Can we default back to PSP if we wanted to, or is it completely gone? PSP will be gone. The, so uh, as far as as far as we know, 1.24 will be the last version that has PSP in it, um, and and that was an. Oh. I mean, it's clearly not going to go away until there's something solid replacing it, because otherwise it would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so so and the 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 Sig Security has said you know the story for PSP doesn't end until the last user. Um, stops using it. Um, the idea is that all the functionality that PSP gave you, you can really get by these these uh, these other projects. Um, and to if, if people need that flexibility, that functionality, to, to defer to those out of tree projects. So why? I mean, why why diverge? Um, so, so the story of Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. The um, so the the and you know I, I don't represent like the 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 Kubernetes project or the community or anything. I, um, but the the, the story uh, over the last five or six years has been let's pull out um, logic and feature that that, that isn't core to uh, orchestrating containers. And let let let's pull out um, you, you know the, the the drivers for specific for, for creating volumes in specific clouds, for instance. So we'll, we'll pull that out of the main Kubernetes project, and and that will be owned as a separate project that the cloud providers can can then take care of, and will be pluggable and extensible. Um, it, so so this is more of a continuation of that for for the built-in security for the built-in. Thing we want something easy to use out of the box, um, but but if you need that flexibility, if you need that granular, that extra tooling, look to your other CNCF projects um, that that will be plugged that will plug into the the workflows that that are available in Kubernetes.
Any last questions, folks? Yep. Uh, so if you if you are using this 1.24 version mm -hmm. and you have these uh, security features set up and you're using them currently and you upgrade to 1.25, what happens? Um, what would happen if you wanted to? Oh, if you had PSP objects um, on a, like existing in your cluster in etcd, the API would be gone. You would get deprecation. You're, you're getting deprecation warnings now, but you would it, there would just be nothing there. There'd be no plugin available to to apply those. Um, so they would they would exist, but wouldn't. Does it default to Um. Yeah. Yeah, I, you would have to label the, the namespace. So you're not, you're, if you're not putting the labels on namespace, you're not, you're, you're not actually using the the the, um, the pod security admission controller. Cool. Well, thanks for the time, y'all. Uh, we'll have one more talk um, in 15-ish minutes, so see y'all then.